most authentic. Do youngsters watch TV anymore? Do you guys watch TV? Nothing. I don't watch that TV. Streaming Shh, by preference. I'm sorry, but there aren't going to be any or nothing. Or no time. Or <laughs> is this a hard luck? Just going to <laughs> yeah, I thought it might be. Oh, come on, it's going to be yeah. fun. And you all look great. I mean, look at you, Thor and, and oh, Peter Pan. That's so cute. Actually, Penny, he's wrong. John Peter Pan. <laughs> Full of pixie dust with your name on it. No, you don't. I hate what Sheldon's supposed to be. Oh, he's the Doppler effect. Doppler effect. Yes. Doppler. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. Oh, sure, I see it now. The Doppler effect. All will be re revealed soon enough. But anyway, let's just go through a couple, a couple of others. We don't need the music for this. So today, let's just talk uh, um, a little bit about the test, just to kind of round things out. I can't say, won't say anything different from the email you got, and then we'll move on to the stuff for uh, this part of the, the class, which is moving on from um, Bernoulli. And so, as is our custom, maybe we'll have some videos first, just a couple of them, to, that it will be relevant to what we'll talk about later on today. Um, uh, this one being for a fireboat in uh, New York Harbor, I guess. Uh, I think the Statue of Liberty is there somewhere. Um, and so Doppler effect and fireboats uh, like this refer to frames of reference. And so there's water squirting out of this boat, say Ford's at one meter a second. Maybe the boat's moving at one meter a second. I'm sure it's not going that fast. And so relative to someone on the boat, the jet's coming out of the uh, the fire hose at one meter a second, but relative to an observer, the boat's moving at one meter and the, the hose is shooting at one meter, so the speed of the, uh, the water relative to a static reference frame is two meters, not one meter. And so we have to think about that when we're talking about conserving momentum in Newton's second law. And that's kind of the, the, the gist of what we'll talk about, one of the things we'll talk about today. A more straightforward example of that is this. Um, I want to play all of this. Like many operators. Uh, and that is using wire lines in a borehole, uh, dropping a sand down the hole to be able to record what's in the borehole walls as you go down to some depth. Um, and that's also relevant to what we'll talk about today. So I'll do a very simple example that shows uh, exactly what's going on. So the idea is that you can have a, a long tool, this uh, uh, sand, I think, I'm not sure, I haven't looked at this. That may just be the stuff that they're putting on to be able to run this tool down inside it. And then as it drops down the hole, it records something. So maybe it has a, a radioactive source in it and it backscatters from hydrogen atoms to be able to measure moisture content or it takes natural gamma ray radiation from the rock to say what's clay and what's sandstone. Um, or it might have a little impeller on it, which is kind of related to fluid mechanics. And drop down the hole, the impeller turns as it goes against the static fluid. If the fluid is moving, the, the impeller will move at a different velocity so you can calculate whether there's water or oil or hydrocarbon moving up or down your, your hole. So that's kind of what we'll talk about uh, today. Anyway, so that's our plan. Um, I sent out something on for Saturday morning, right? First thing. So it's probably not very useful to us to, to go over and post-mortem, over post-mortem the test. I tried to say all the things that are, are really relevant uh, for you. Uh, in that email. Um, so in terms of the tests, uh, some of the, on Friday's tests, the key on Canvas had two questions from, actually if you look at last year's test, you'll see exactly that the question answers for, um, looks like four and five, were 0 0.6 and 0 0.33 to some power. That was left over from last year. So I went back through it and any, so there were seven parts of the multiple choice question. So about one in seven of you got the question right randomly. <laughs> and the other six out of seven didn't. So I, I upped the points, I, which was either 15 or 20 points for that. And also, if you got the right answer for the previous question, which was 0.34,
then I changed your points to that. And the one person who pointed it out to me, I gave double points on, on, that, uh, that, on that question. So, so anything that we get wrong, we correct in your favor. Actually, the people who put point six down, which is the wrong answer, but was right last year, I didn't change those scores. Um, you note that we changed it from dual sub submissions in <coughs> test one to only one in tests two and three. I think that works better. I think, it, I think you know, it was never meant that people were using it to be able to see what the right and wrong answers were. And I think people who are using that uh, found out some wrong questions and in past years have gone back and changed all their answers around and not really done them any help uh, in doing that. So I think we'll go with the, the one submission in the past. So the, the scores were not fantastic, but actually they never are on the first test. I think the one good thing about the way we do the tests now in three separate days um, allows you, if you get a horrible score on day one, to kind of recalibrate immediately rather than get a horrible score for a three-part test on one sitting, which it used to be in the past. And so I think that works in your favor. And certainly if you look at the, the changes in the grades as they occurred over the, the class lifetime, they, they improved, which is right, which is great. Um, I did put down the, how they compared to last year's. They're pretty, pretty similar. Uh, they're a bit lower, but uh, not substantially so. Um, they always get better with the passage of exams. I, I, I've always asked the students, both at this stage and also at the end of classes, and when I talk to students after the, after the class is finished, what do we do to, to stop the first exam being so horrible? And I've never really got a satisfactory response to that. I think I've always come to the conclusion it's kind of a two-part thing. I probably have too much time at the beginning of the semester, perhaps putting together too ingenious a, a question, maybe. But I think also that uh, I'm not sure that everyone absolutely believes me when I say, uh, if you're doing great on the assignments, that's fine. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition for you to do well in the class. And I think working towards the tests, and there are many, many years of tests uh, previously, and working those solutions through yourself, I don't think necessarily numerically working them through, but I th if I was doing this, I think I'd look at the question, I'd cover the answer, and I'd think about how I do it, and write the equation for doing it, see if it's right or wrong, and then move on to the next one. So not work them out in great detail, but at least be able to be sure that I could to do it. So um, it's always desirable in these tests that uh, we don't have follow-on questions. That possibly wasn't the case for the first question on Monday. Um, many people, I think, forgot that they should apply buoyancy to the displaced weight of the metal. You know, it's a, maybe a 10% of the, the force is due to buoyant because it was 10,000. I can't remember what, exactly what the mass, the density of the, the, the unnamed material was, but you had to apply buoyancy. And so that wasn't great. But I did check the other two questions. And I think the Wednesday question, there were only 40 out of 110. So I guess that's uh, 70 points of the total were not in any way related to any previous question. Uh, and I think uh, the other one, it was only, it was 80. It was 30 and 40 if, for follow-on questions on each of those. And so that's my goal, is that we have that, that there are not so many follow-ons. But of course, there have to be follow-on questions. Otherwise, it'd be a, a not very interesting test. Perhaps that's not your interest in having an interesting test, but there's, there's usually a message in some of these uh, tests. So that's kind of the way it was. So some of you would have done well and been happy with it, some perhaps less well. There's probably strength in numbers knowing that you're within the, the realm of where it's been in the past. Uh, I did mention that 40% of the students got A's last year. Actually, I think 80% of the students got A's last year. For COVID, we almost we gave away the farm in terms of extra credit. And so the 40 were if you used our current rubric in terms of grading schemes for this equivalent to this class, which is equivalent to the, the years before this class. It was changed last year as a gift. I'm not sure it's a good gift if you get an A whether you, where you would have not got that in the past, but that's the way it is. Um, and so that's where we are now. And so, so these are always interesting uh, classes immediately after the test. A little bit frosty sometimes. I guess the good things that came out of it for me was at least a few of you stopped by. So one person stopped by to chat before. 
Uh, three of you uh, stopped by, not with any agenda, I think, to change grades, but just, well, it's, I'm clear it was related to the test, but it was just a discussion. Where are you from? That's an interesting last name. Where's that come from? How many generations are you American? What do you do in your spare time? Pretty non-threatening stuff. So yeah, I encourage people to, to do that. Um, I, whether it's with me or with someone else in another class, you may be looking for um, a recommendation or a letter of recommendation for grad school or something else in the future. If you know someone to write a letter for you that can say more than uh, student X got an X grade in a challenging course in fluid mechanics, which I always offer to write for people, but that's not very informative to people looking at admission for grad schools. So it's always good to make connections. I've always been imp impressed that people can hold down conversations with adults, with boomers. <laughs> can, uh, I think it's a good omen for life. It, it's a good starter because that's what you're going to have to do at some stage in your life as well. And, and, yeah, and a, and a free-ranging conversation. It's not particularly threatening. So I encourage people to, uh, to come by and say hi. Um, and yeah, and my little advice at the base there saying how you might go about if you're not happy uh, with your, how things worked out for you. Any questions before we go on? Uh, happy to take them. Um, no? Yeah, all right, good, that's enough. Well, my advice is put it all behind you. And uh, if it worked out, great, fantastic. If it didn't work out so fantastic, then that's okay. There's plenty of time to, you realize, of course, the scoring. So there's 10% extra for each of the midterms and the final. So 75% of the course is on uh, the exams. It's like that because I wanted to make sure it's your work. Um, they're 30 minutes because uh, I want to have enough time in the scheduled time in classes to be able to put someone who's having extra time, double that, uh, within, the exam, within the class period. And the classes, I think, are uh, questions are modeled to be kind of 30 minute tests. There is a bit of pressure in there, but I think that's also to be able to to make sure that there's no try at least try and avoid collusion, which obviously we don't don't want. Um, we don't um, curve, but those tests are each 10% extra. So the total score for the class is 100% plus 7.5% extra for the 75% tests. So it's 107.5, and then there's five credits for the extra credit stuff. The, the stuff that we do when we're not in class for the test. So there's the first of those, I guess, you've had one for Labor Day. Uh, it's the only class we've missed otherwise. Do you have them for last week? Uh, the first two will close on tonight at midnight for Monday and Wednesday. And then Friday's one will close on, on Wednesday, two periods after. So I encourage you to, um, to, to go and do those. So that's kind of where we are. All right. Oh yeah, and the, and the other thing in that comment was that last year, uh, foolishly, my bad, I posted the uh, exams to open up on you know, 7.55 on Monday, but the, the exams are open. Uh, to, so some of the students had seen the test before, and some students did very well, and so that was a kind of a bummer for me because it takes me, I know, I know you, I don't expect you to have much compassion for me, but it takes probably two days to put those three questions together and solve them and put the key in on Canvas and all those kinds of things. So it meant that in between the Monday and the Wednesday, I had to make two brand new questions to, to do. And so I just annulled the, the scores for the Monday. Interestingly enough, two people out of 130 mentioned that, hey, Professor, did you know that the, we'd seen the exam before we did it? Uh, one of those is your TA. And one of those was some other, another student, and only two for the whole time. Uh, I'm pretty sure the students were expecting the, the exam that they'd seen before for the Wednesday morning, but they were a bit surprised by that. And so I gave double scores to the guys uh, who, uh, who spilled the beans, so to speak. And so I thought that was an interesting uh, lesson. So, anyway. Okay. So, hearing nothing else, then uh, let's forge ahead. So, the the material, I didn't check to see who has looked at whatever uh, for the past classes of last week, uh, but I will make uh, the comment that I think for uh, week five, 
there are five kind of topics that you'll see. One is, uh, I'll draw it, free jets. And so the idea is that if you have a container that has fluid in it, and that fluid is coming out of the bottom, then you can write Bernoulli in terms of these two points, points one and two, and solve Bernoulli. Uh, we can use the, the big tank approximation. If you ever see big tank in an, a question, it means that one of the velocities is zero. The tank is so big that when this thing is flowing, the volume change here is so small compared to the, the speed of the fluid coming out of here that, for instance, uh, V1 you can set equal to zero. And if you do that, then you can solve for something called the free jet. And just by using Bernoulli, you could do it just as well as I can. If you look at the height here, it's 2gh square root. And so you may have seen that if you've looked at this already. It's an important equation. just comes from Bernoulli. That velocity is the same as if it's coming out of a hole in the side, for instance. And there's all kinds of interesting questions that can be uh, done with that. So in week five, that's one of the applications. You'll see we just did some questions. I guess the second one is the idea. We talked before about maybe flow around an airfoil. And so if you're looking at flow that goes around it, we did some work on looking at changes in pressures normal to the streamlines and parallel to them. So we use the concept of uh, continuity. I guess I could make that bigger, right? So continuity requires that if we're defining a velocity v1 and a cross-sectional area, A1. So cross-sectional area would be this height times the distance into the page. And this would be V2. So instead of looking at a streamline, we're looking at kind of a stream tube, the, the vo volume that's enclosed between two adjacent streamlines. And this has some area A2. Then continuity requires that the density of the fluid times the area of flow times the velocity of flow has to be equal at both of those places. And so we'll talk about control volumes today. We're talking about conservation of mass today, but this is basically a very simple statement of that conservation equation. And that says that the mass rate of flow into the upstream part, because it's not changing with time, has to be the same amount that's coming out of the bottom. It's just like having a pipe, right? The stuff, the rate that you put in the, the upstream side has to be the, the rate that comes out of the downstream side if it's not accumulating somewhere. And of course, we said that Bernoulli requires that there's no accumulation, it's steady state. And so we can use this. The, so the, the reason for using this is that, for instance, in this case, if you had, for instance, two unknown velocities, you can link velocity one to velocity two just in terms of what a velocity, if you know what the areas. Densities typically don't change, so you might be able to just throw this away, get rid of these two, and it's just the cross-sectional area times the volume. So that's the second thing that's in your week five stuff. Uh, so if you have Bernoulli's equation and you have only, you have two un unknowns instead of just one unknown, then you can constrain it if it's one of the velocities. And the third thing, uh, is merely um, using pressures uh, to get either velocities or flow rates. And so uh, we've talked about it in this class already. We've talked about pitot tubes, the things that you see on the side of an airplane, which measures, uh, has stagnation of the pressure in front of this little right angle arm, and from that stagnation pressure, you can calculate the airspeed. And so often it's convenient to measure pressures and try and convert that into a velocity that you're flying through the air at. Or also use a pressure in a Venturi meter or in a weir. And so if you have 
a river that's flowing downstream and you put a weir in its place so that water comes out of the bottom at some height then typically measuring this height allows you to calculate a flow velocity and so it's often much more convenient to measure use a pressure in a venturi meter or in a pitot tube or in uh, measure heights as you go downstream uh, in rivers to weir off a river and measure the uh, the flow rate directly from just this height it's, you can scale them directly and so that's basically the material of week uh, week number five so okay so um, this is still the equation that we're working with in terms of Bernoulli. I'm not sure in your stuff that you'll look at, we'll talk about losses, but Bernoulli requires that these two terms are both equal to zero. And these two terms relate to energy losses. So you know that when you push fluid down a pipe, there's some frictional loss because you have to typically apply a pump to be able to do that, or there's some head loss as you go from upstream to downstream. And so round about week 10 and 11, a big part of what we'll talk about is to try and figure out exactly what these frictional losses are. And the frictional losses just merely mean that if, you, if I drag my bag across the counter, it's resisted by friction on the base. If I push it back to where it was, this friction that's applied always reacts against motion. And so frictional losses on this bag are no different from the friction that occurs by viscosity of water flowing down a pipe. And so that's going to be something that we'll have to look at when we talk about flow in pipes. And it's re relevant to what we'll talk about today because um, the first part of the class, I'm talking a lot to get going here, the first part of the class was fluid statics. So that's done up to 4.1 and accelerating fluids. That's taken care of. Bernoulli is fluid dynamics for fluids which have no viscosity, which was weeks four and five. And now we'll spend three weeks talking about conservation laws. And so the conservation laws that we'll talk about, one in each of the weeks. This week, which I guess is six, right, is mass. And if you distill it down, it's exactly this equation here. Nothing more than that. Mass in equals mass out plus accumulation. If, if more goes in than comes out, then there has to be a net accumulation. The second one in week seven, didn't mean to put a Z there, is uh, momentum. And so in other words, F equals MA is equal to change in velocity with time. So these two things together, mass times velocity is momentum. Rates of change of momentum define Bernoulli's equation essentially. And so we'll look at that for non-standard uh, geometries. And eight will be energy. So kinetic energy, you know, is a half mv squared. It's actually similar to this, that they're related. But of course, there are other forms of energy you have as well. For instance, converting chemical energy into kinetic energy, as in a jet engine, burning jet fuel, is another mechanism by which we convert that. So the, the three classes, or three weeks of classes that we have will be conservation equations. So that's what we're kind of talking about now. And so why is it relevant to what we talked about uh, in terms of the, the, the movies that we just saw? So we saw a Doppler effect. So Doppler effect is meow, right? The frequency changes as something goes past you because it's uh, relative frequency changes as it's coming towards you versus going away from you. But it has to fight against the velocity that it's traveling at. And we talked about dropping a son down a borehole to be able to measure behaviors. And so in all of these conservation equations, uh, both for mass, momentum, and energy, we have to have some kind of control volume. And that control volume we can think of as being fixed and non-deformable. So that would be taking a portion of a pipe and just isolating that portion of a pipe, looking at the volume rate that goes in, 
and the volume rate that goes out, and we could write exactly what we had before as as this, right? Very simply. And actually, what we would conclude, I think, is that if the cross-sectional areas are the same and it's steady state, then V1 has to equal V2. Quite simply, right? From this equation. So long as the densities aren't changing. And in liquids, that's probably the case. In gases, may not be, but, but in liquids, almost certainly the case. So we can think of a fixed, non-deforming control volume. We can think of a moving, non-deforming control volume. So a jet engine would be a good uh, uh, example of that. It's depending on how you're looking at it. If you're sitting in uh, in seat six B, six six A, I guess, uh, and looking out on the wing, then relative to you, it's not moving. But probably it is moving relative to a static observer, and so it's not deforming. It's staying the same size but it's moving from point A to point B with time. I guess it'd be moving in this direction. And so we can account for the fact that the fluids going into this, have, we have to do something to be able to account for the fact that it's actually moving relative to those fluids. And so we'll have to figure out exactly how to do that. And then the final one, so fixed, non-deforming, moving, non-deforming, and moving and deforming, well the classic example of that is taking a balloon and just letting it go. Clearly it's moving because it's flitting all around the room and it's also changing in volume as it travels. And so it may seem trivial but those are the best uh, examples we can come up with of, of what those control volumes are. So we'll deal with those in, in due course. So, but to be able to make a start on that, we need to be able to understand something about control volumes and rel reference frames. And so that's the, the, f the first part, maybe. It's easier to do it by example. So maybe reference frames. I know you don't want to be very complimentary to me today, but isn't my writing getting much better? Not bad at all. And so we need to refer to uh, the substantial or material derivative. And I guess that you've seen these before. And the, the most obvious example of this is that we can use Newton's second law and write it as this. We've always written it before as lowercase d, uh, but actually it has to be this sub substantial derivative. And so the reference frame has to be such that it's relevant to the, the, the planet, I guess, right? Because gravity is defined relative to the static planet. So this has to be the, the correct uh, reference frame. And the easiest way for us to think about this is to uh, maybe do an example. Uh, yeah, I think it's quite a good example, actually. Maybe take uh, the borehole example. So we've got a borehole. We're going to drop a sun down from the surface, and we're going to measure temperature. Temperature is a scalar value, not a vector like velocity. So it makes life a bit easier. And uh, we're going to look at this substantial derivative. And so, if you know anything about the temperature of the Earth, uh, you'd know that the therm geothermal gradient is something like 25 degrees centigrade per kilometer. Go down a kilometer, it goes up from about 20 at the surface to 45. Uh, Z, this is negative Z in our uh, geometry. And so this is equal to uh, dT dZ. Actually, it'd be negative 25, right? This is positive. This is going downwards. So for this to be the correct sign, it has to be minus 25. So what we could do is we could play the game that we've played before. So let's not talk about velocity, but let's talk about rate of change of temperature with time. And we can rewrite that 
as this plus I'm just going to do two for now because we, we don't need the other coordinate systems. So what we could do is we could multiply, it seems that we're adding both of these together but we're not. We could multiply this through by dt over dt and we can multiply this through by d, dz by dz. And so this obviously is equal to 1, so we don't care about this. But this we can rearrange, and we can take it so that we combine these two terms and these two terms. And so if we write this out in longhand, this is going to be change in temperature with time plus change in temperature with elevation and multiplied by change in location, elevation, with time. So this term, the last term clearly is just, uh, let me do it properly, this term here is just velocity z, right? Change in location with time is just the velocity at which we're dropping a son down. And so what we're going to do is we're going to drop a son down, S-O-N-D-E, uh, and we're going to have it go down the hole at um, one kilometer an hour. Vz equals minus one kilometer per hour. And so now what this refers to is if we're driving this car down here, this is the change in temperature we see as a function of time. And so we can calculate that. So change in temperature with time is going to be equal to the change in temperature with time in the static coordinate space. So we're looking at this picture right now, and it looks like this. This is the gradient. If we look at it in 10 minutes, that's still the gradient, so it's not changing in time. So this term for the overall behavior is nothing. And we're adding to the, this term. Change in temperature with it, elevation is minus 25 kilometers per, at 25 centigrade per kilometer. 25 Kelvin per kilometer, I guess. No, that's confusing, right? Degrees C per kilometer. And if we multiply it by the velocity, that is equal to times one kilometer per hour. It's minus as well, right, because of what we had here. And so the change in temperature with time that we'd see if we were in this car going down in the sand would be zero plus 25 centigrade kilometers hour. So in other words, if we were plotting um, the change in temperature with time in this thing going down the hole, this would be temperature, this would be time, this would be one hour, this would be 25 centigrade. Right? So in one hour, we'd have gone down some amount. Sorry. 25 centigrade and this would be one kilometer and we'd get to this point after one hour so that's all it is so we, the substantial derivative is just if you're driving a car and the temperature was changing outside you're driving a car or flying down from the Arctic to the equator zero degrees to 40 degrees centigrade then that static change in temperature is what this magnitude here is changing with location, and this is the velocity at which you're traveling. And so if you travel for one hour, then you'd know that the temperature would change such and such. That's all. If, for instance, you could imagine that by some miracle, stupid thing here, but by some miracle, the temperature overall was rising so that it was rising, say, 
one degree C, let's say five degrees C per hour, five degrees C per hour, right? So if through some magic uh, process in the Earth was making the temperature start off at this zero at the surface, then after an hour it was five degrees centigrade at the surface, then 10 degrees centigrade after two hours, etc. Then that's what this would look like. And then this equation would be slightly different. That equation would be, this second term now would be five degrees centigrade per hour. It's increasing, so this would be plus. And if the sonde was also at the same time going down for one hour, obviously it would get to this point here. And so its trajectory would be this inclined line. So this would be plus 25 degrees C per hour. And that would be after one hour, it would be 30 degrees C per hour. Adding those up. That's all it is. So that's a, kind of a, a, a useful example to, to be able to show. Because uh, you could measure the temperatures, and it's typically done with a sensor that goes down a borehole. I said before, the other thing that goes down on a wire line is a little impeller. And so what you can do is drop a sun down, it has a, an impeller at the front. As it drops down in the static uh, fluid, if it is static, the impeller will go. And you'll be able to measure how quickly the, the static fluid is flowing past it. If you know the velocity of the sun itself, you can calibrate it to be able to uh, figure out what the velocity of the fluid is. Then when you bring it up, it does the reverse effect, uh, and you can actually calculate what, what the fluid velocity would be in the well bore. And so that might seem a stupid idea, but often in well bores, you have fractures which have a certain pressure, say two reservoirs with different pressures. By drilling a well bore between them, you connect them, and there may be flow from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir. And of course, if you drop a sonde down and measure the velocity profile as you go down, you can plot exactly what that, where fluid comes into the hole and fluid goes out of the hole. And so you can imagine that might be a, a useful thing to be able to do. So that's kind of the idea of what it is. So that the simplest example is to use temperature because temperature is a scalar value. It has magnitude but not direction. Velocity is more difficult because obviously velocity is not a scalar value. So Newton's second law, if we write it out, would be uh, it would be it would be a vector and it would be a vector and so it would look something like this it would look some I'll, I'll get rid of this it would be forces in the x direction forces in the y direction and forces in the z direction are equal to the mass multiplied by, I could write this out as rate of change, oh, that's too complicated, I could write it out as acceleration in x, acceleration in y, and acceleration in z. And so this equation, Newton's second law, is really three equations, right? For the reasons that we know. It's resolved in, in three different directions. And so we can do the same that we did before. So the idea is this is the change in temperature that you experience in your car when you're traveling. This is the change in temperature that you see static outside uh, and if it's changing in time. So this is, the, you want to have the temperature relative to um, what you're driving. So the relevance for us is that the acceleration and the energy we have to put in to work against inertia if we're driving in a car it has to be the rate of change of velocity of us in the car as we're moving in that reference frame. And so all we're doing is we're moving it from a static reference frame, which is what Bernoulli is, right? If you see these flow lines, you have a velocity at different places in space. And the fluid is tracking through that along a streamline to go from V1 to V2. And so it's the, the, the velocity as it tracks through that, which is important in defining what the inertia is. So, so that's it. So, well, so there's an example here, there's a bunch of equations, same example that we talked about before. But we can make the case, uh, and perhaps I won't write this out in longhand, but just talk about it. So if we're talking about F equals dV dt, 
Then this term, I guess we need a mass in here. Then this term here are the accelerations. And we just said before that these accelerations are in those four, three different coordinate directions. X, Y, and Z. And so we can calculate exactly what this expression is exactly by doing this. We took the substantial derivative. We could have written it out also that it was changing with dt, dt, and multiplied by dx, dx. And we could also have added the term dt, dt, dy, dy. And if we looked at the individual components here, this is how the velocity in the y direction, and this is the velocity in the x direction. And this was the velocity in the z direction, right? dz dt, dx dt, dy dt. We're going vertically downwards, so there is no component in x or in y, so we don't need it, and that's why I didn't do it. But if we want to do it for Newton's law, we, we have to realize that velocity has these three components. And so if we take the rate of change of velocity to represent acceleration, then these would be the accelerations. Acceleration in the x direction is the rate of change of velocity in the x direction as a function of time. It would be plus du dt, but instead of that we would write it as du dt dx dx. So that would be this term here. So all we're going to do is we're going to take the velocity term, dx dt, which would be this, and multiply it by du dx, which is left over. So, and you see these start repeating each other. And so we have exactly the same idea that if we use us traveling in the car and our acceleration within the car as the important property, this component here, then we get it from any changes we have in the velocity field external to us as a function of time, plus the spatial accelerations. So these terms we refer to as convective accelerations. And the meaning of that is that if you have fluid moving in a pipe, uh, when it, if it changes velocity from point A to point B, even if you're not in that fluid that's traveling, it has an acceleration. And that acceleration is given by how quickly the velocity changes is going from x1 to x2, multiplied by its original velocity. If you like, this is the v squared over 2g term that kind of is in Bernoulli along a streamline. So that's what these are. And so without belaboring the point, you end up with um, a component which is due to changes in temperature with location, which is this one and ones which change as you go down due to the fact that you're moving through the, the coordinate system. And you can use those to be able to calculate uh, exactly what the velocities would, what the accelerations would be if you only know a picture of the velocities. So imagine you take a picture of some flow around an airfoil. So you know at every point around that airfoil what the velocity is at points A, B, C, D, E, F, and so certainly you can, as you move along the streamline between points A and B, you can see that it changes from 1 meter a second to 1.1 meter a second. So you know something about this magnitude here, and you also know what the average between those would be. So 1 and 1.1, the average would be 1.05. So you have a magnitude of the velocity and also the change in velocity as it goes from location to location. And so you can calculate what its acceleration is without being in that fluid, because it's the, the acceleration that you experience if you are that packet of fluid that you want to know, but you might want to only have information that says how the velocity changes in space, not as you're traveling along it in a little micro capsule. And so just to kind of cement those ideas, here's a very simple example. It's from the book. If you have a velocity field that says that the velocity in the x direction is equal to two times x, the velocity in the y direction is equal to minus y, and the velocity in the z direction is equal to the coordinate of z. That, of course, means that if you're at point zero, 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 all of these velocities are zero. As you move away from point zero to, say, 
How's it look? Right? This is our x, this is our y, and this is our z. What is that noise? So if initially you're at point zero, then the, uh, the velocity field is that the velocity in the x direction here is equal to 2x. x is equal to zero, so it's zero. So the velocity at 0, 0, 0 is equal to 0 for these, right? If you're at some other point, which is one unit here, one unit in y, and one unit in z. So if you're at point <coughs> 1, 1, 1, then these velocities, these are the velocities. These are going to be 2, minus 1, and so it's kind of a contrived example, but you get the point that maybe something that's swirling around is going at no velocity here uh, and is going at some larger velocity here, given by this equation. So all this means that, is that if you want to calculate what the accelerations are in the x direction, you need to know what the change in velocity in the x direction is with time. These are all independent of time, so this is zero. You need to know the velocity in u and the rate, the rate of change of velocity with respect to x. So this would be uh, 2x would be the velocity. And the rate of change of velocity with dv dx, which is the other term, would be the derivative of this, which would be 2. The one for this would be velocity in the y direction would be minus And the rate of change of that would be plus minus 1, I guess, T multiplied by each other, of course, not added. And likewise, for uh, this component here, it would be equal to plus z times the derivative times 1. And I think that's done for you down here. Um, actually, these would be the derivatives. So these terms that I've just calculated would be this term, velocity times in x times the derivative, it would be this term here, the velocity in y times its derivative, and it would be this term here, the velocity in z times its derivative. You'll notice that these off-diagonal terms, uh, the rate of change of velocity in the x direction with y would be the derivative of this with respect to y, which is zero. So all these, in this particular example, all these off-diagonal terms end up being zero because the derivatives are zero. And so the only terms that exist are these ones on the diagonal. And so you can go down through the solution. It does it exactly here. So the, the accelerations in the x, y, and z directions are given by those expressions we just defined. 2x times 2 minus y times 1, etc. And so if you go back to our coordinate system that I'll just draw out again and we look at those points then um, the accelerations at these points will be x is 0, y is 0, z is 0 so we could write out at the point 0, 0, 0 and the same as before, but now our accelerations, instead of our velocities, will be 0, 0, 0. Right? If you put x equals 0, y equals 0, and z equals 0, those will be these three accelerations. And if we choose the point 1, 1, 1, just as we did before, then that would be, if I change colors, one item out here, one item here and one item up. So it would be this point here. This would be one, one, one. And the velocities would be, accelerations rather, would be equal to, uh, x is equal to one. So it would be two times one times two, be plus four. It would be equal to, this would be equal to one, so it would be minus one times minus one, 
So it would be plus 1. And this would be equal to 1 times 1. So this is plus 1 also. So those would be the accelerations. So that's it. So kind of a contrived example, but you get the idea is that the accelerations in x, y, and z at this point would be those magnitudes. And I guess the main point is that you've calculated it only from knowing what a picture of the velocities look like. You don't know how those velocities change if you're moving through the system. You just take a snapshot of them. They're the same at all times, uh, which is the reason why we could throw away this term here. These are all zero. And it turns out that it's just the terms on the leading diagonal that turn out to be substantial. I guess, um, yeah, if these were 2x times y, for instance, you'd end up with some terms that existed somewhere else. But it's a contrived example. So the main point today is that we have to be able to think about reference frames. So if you think about the uh, fire tenders in New York City Harbor, if the fire tender is moving at one meter a second, and it's squirting water out at one meter a second, then relative to someone who's a static observer, that jet is traveling at boat speed plus the squirt speed, which is one plus one, which is two meters, miles per hour or meters per second. So that's important because if you're getting that in the chest by standing in front of the tender, it matters whether it's going at one meter plus one meter uh, because it's relative to, to your reference frame, which is not moving. If the boat is moving at one meter a second forward and squirting backwards at one meter a second, then the water never gets you, right? Because it's going at zero velocity. And so it all cancels out. So we have to be conscious of reference frames because Newton's uh, second law is really written in, that terms, in terms of that reference frame, which has to be relative to the speed you're going down in your car. Going down in a sand, down a hole, the substantial derivative is what we'll use in our calculations. Okay? So anyway, so that's it. Thanks very much.